Alright, folks, welcome to Paper Cuts. Uh, last we left off, we were about to dive into the uh, second volume of The Last Man. Um, before we dive into things too far, uh, I should mention I am home for Christmas, so if anything seems odd, weird, or not functioning correctly, that's why. Um... <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we streamed the whole first season of Paper Cuts from home, but, um, you know, it's been a long time since things were set up that way. So, do you keep that in mind? Anyway, uh, I am going to, speaking of things, can I? Yeah, I needed to increase the font size a little bit because I'm sitting in a little bit of a different spot. Uh, Alright, let's dive into... Uh, hang on. Okay. For real this time, let's dive into the first chapter of the second volume of The Last Man. During this voyage, when on calm evenings we conversed on deck, watching the glancing of waves and the changeful appearances of the sky, I discovered the total revolution that the disasters of Raymond had wrought in the mind of my sister. When they the same, when they, were they the same waters of love, which lately cold and cutting as ice, repelling as that, now loosened from their frozen chains, flowed through the regions of her soul? in gushing and grateful existence? My phone apparently felt the need to interject. She did not believe that he was dead, but she knew that he was in danger, and the hope of assisting in his liberation and the idea of soothing by tenderness the ills that he might have undergone elevated and harmonized the late jarring element of her being. I was not so sanguine as she to the result of our voyage. She was not sanguine, but secure, and the expectation of seeing the lover she had banished, the husband, friend, heart's companion from whom she'd been long alienated, wrapped her senses in delight, her mind in placidity. It was beginning life again, it was leaving barren sands for an abode of fertile beauty. It was a harbor after a tempest, an opiate after sleepless nights, a happy waking from a terrible dream. Little Clara accompanied us. The poor child did not understand what she was going forward. She heard that we were bound for Greece, that she would see her father, and now, for the first time, she prattled of him to her mother. On landing at Athens, we found difficulties increase upon us. Nor could the storied earth or balmy atmosphere inspire us with enthusiasm or pleasure, while the fate of Raymond was in jeopardy. No man had ever excited so strong an interest in the public mind. This was apparent even above, among the phlegmatic English, from whom he had long been absent. The Athenians had expected their hero to return in triumph. The women had taught their children to lisp his name joined to thanksgiving. His manly beauty, his courage, his devotion to their cause made him appear in their eyes almost as one of the ancient, <coughs> ancient deities of the soil descended from their native Olympus to defend them. When they, spoke, when they spoke of his probable death and certain captivity, tears streamed from their eyes. Even as the women of Syria sorrowed for Adonis, so did the wives and mothers of Greece lament our English Raymond. Athens was a city of mourning. All these shows of despair tr struck Perdita with a, with a fright. With that sanguine but confused expectation which desire engendered while she was at a distance from reality, she had formed an image in her mind of instantaneous change when she should set her foot on Grecian shores. She fancied that Raymond would already be free, and that her tender attentions would come to entirely obliterate the mem memory of his misenchance. But his fate was still uncertain. She began to fear the worst, and to feel that her soul's hope was cast on a chance that might prove a blank. The wife and lovely child of Lord Raymond became objects of intense interest in Athens. The gates of their abode were besieged. Audible prayers were breathed for his restoration. All these circumstances added to the dismay and fears of Perdita.
My exertions were unremitted. After a time, I left Athens and joined the army stationed at Kishan in Thrace. Barbary, or rather bribery threats and intrigues soon discovered the secret that Raymond was alive, a prisoner, suffering the most rigorous confinement and wanton cruelties. We put in movement every impulse of policy and money to redeem him from their hands. The impatience of my sister's disposition now returned on her, awakened by repentance, sharpened by remorse. The very beauty of the Grecian climate during the season of spring added torture to her sensations. The unexampled loveliness of the flower-clad earth, the genial sunshine and grateful shade, the melody of the birds, the majesty of the woods, the splendor of the marble ruins, the clear effluence of stars by night, the combination of it all was that exciting and voluptuous in this transcending land. It inspired a quicker spirit of life and an added sensitiveness to every articulation of her frame, but only gave edge to the poignancy of her grief. Each long hour was counted, and he suffers was the burden of all her thoughts. She abstained from food, she lay on the bare earth, and by such mimicry of his enforced torments endeavored to hold communion with his distant pain. I remembered in one of her harshest moments, a, a quotation of mine had roused her to anger and disdain. Perdita, I'd said, some day you will discover that you've done wrong in again casting Raymond on the thorns of life. When disappointment has sullied his beauty, when a soldier's hardships have bent his manly form, and when loneliness have made even triumph bitter to him, then you will repent, and regret for the irreparable change will move in all the hearts of the rocky now the late remorse of love. The stinging remorse of love now pierced her heart. She accused herself of his journey to Greece, his dangers, his imprisonment. She pictured to herself the anguish of his solitude. She remembered with what eager delight he had in former days made her the partner of his joyful hopes, with what grateful affection he received her sympathy in his cares. She called to mind how often he had declared what that solitude was to him the greatest of all evils, and how death itself was to him more full of fear and pain when he pictured himself a lonely grave. My best girl, he'd said, Reli relieves me from these fantasies. United to her, cherished in her dear heart, never again shall I know the misery of finding myself alone. Even if I die before you, my Perdita, treasure up my ashes until yours may mingle with mine. It's a foolish sentiment for one who's not a materialist, and yet, methinks, even in that dark cell, I may feel my inanimate dust mingle with yours, and thus have a companion in decay. In her resentful mood, these expressions had been remembered with acrimony and disdain. They visited her in her softened hour, taking sleep from her eyes. <sighs> All hope of rest from her from her weary mind. Two months passed thus, when at last we obtained a promise of Raymond's release. Confinement and hardship had undermined his health. The Turks feared an accomplishment of the threats of the English government if he did die under their hands. They looked upon his recovery as impossible. They delivered him up as a dying man, willingly making over to us the rites of burial. He came by sea from Constantinople to Athens. The wind, which was favorable to him, blew so strongly in shore that we were unable, as we had at first intended, to meet him on his watery road. The watchtower of Athens was besieged by inquirers, each sail legally looked out for. Till the first of May, the gallant frigate bore in sight, freighted with treasure more invaluable than the wealth which piloted from Mexico the vexed Pacific swallowed, or that was conveyed over its tranquil bosom to enrich the crown of Spain. At early dawn the vessel was discovered bearing in shore. It was, con it was conjectured that it would cast anchor about five miles from land. The news spread throughout Athens, and the whole city <sighs> and the whole city poured out at the gate of the Pica oh, sorry, Piraeus down the roads, through the vineyards, the olive woods, and plantations of trees towards the harbor. 
the noisy joy of the populace, the gaudy colors of their dress, the tumult of carriages and horses, the march of soldiers intermixed. The waving of banners and sound of martial music was added to the high excitement of the scene. While round us re reposed in solemn majesty the relics of an ancient time, to our right the Acropolis rose high, spectators of a thousand changes of ancient glory, Turkish slavery, and the restoration of dear-bought liberty. Tombs and, et and cenotaphs were strewn thick around, adorned by ever-renewing vegetation. The mighty dead hovered over their monuments, and beheld in our enthusiasm and congregated numbers a renewal of the scenes in which they had been the actors. Perdita and Clara rode in a close carriage. I attended them on horseback. At length we arrived at the harbor. It was agitated by the outward swell of the sea. The beach, as far as could be discerned, was covered by a moving multitude, which, urged by those behind the sea, again rushed back as the heavy waves, with sullen roar, burst close to them. I applied my glass, and could discern that the frigate had already cast anchor, fearful of the danger of approaching nearer to the lee shore. A boat was lowered, and with a pang I saw that Raymond was unable to descend the vessel's side. He was let down in a chair, and lay wrapped in cloaks at the bottom of the boat. Give me just a moment, I need to blow my nose. So sorry about that. I just, uh, thought I felt a little congested. Let me grab a little water, and we'll dive back in to where we were. <clears throat> I dismounted and called to some sailors who were rowing about the harbor to pull up and take me into their skiff. Perdita, at the same moment, alighted from her carriage. She seized my arm. Take me with you, she cried. She was trembling and pale, and Clara clung to her. You, you must not. The sea is rough. He'll soon be here. Do you not see his boat? The little bark to which I had beckoned had now pulled up. Before I could stop her, Perdita, assisted by the sailors that were in it, Clara followed her mother. A loud shout echoed from the crowd as we pulled out of the inner harbor, while my sister was at the prow and caught hold of one of the men who was using a glass, asking a thousand questions, careless of the spray that broke over her, deaf, sightless to all except the little speck that, just visible on top of the waves, evidently neared. We approached with all the speed six rowers could give. The orderly and picturesque dress of the, of the soldiers on the beach, the sounds of exalting music, the stirring breeze and waving flags, the 
unchecked exclamations of the eager crowd, whose dark locks, whose dark looks and foreign garb were purely eastern. The sight and the sight of temple-crowned rock, the white marble of the buildings glittering the sun, and standing in bright relief against the dark ridge of lofty mountains beyond. The near roar of the sea. The splash of oars and dash of spray, all steeped in my soul a delirium, unfelt, unimagined in the common course of common life. Trembling, I was, una I was unable to continue to look through the glass with which I had watched the motion of the crew when the frigate's boat had been first launched. We rapidly drew near, so that at length the number and forms of those within could be discerned. Its dark sides grew big, and the splash of its oars became audible. I could distinguish the languid form of my friend as he half raised himself at our approach. Perdita's questions had ceased. She leaned on my arm, panting with emotions too acute for tears. Our men pulled alongside the other boat. As a last effort, my sister mustered her strength, her firmness. She stepped from one boat to the other, then with a shriek she sprang towards Raymond, knelt at his side, and gluing her lips to the hand she seized, her face shrouded by her long hair, gave herself up to tears. Raymond had someone, somewhat raised himself at our approach, but it was with difficulty that he exerted himself even this much. With sunken cheek and hollow eyes, pale and gaunt, how could I recognize the beloved of Perdita? I continued awestruck and mute. He looked smilingly on the poor girl. The smile was his. A day of sunshine falling on a dark valley displays its before hidden characteristics, and now this smile, the same with which he had first spoke love to Perdita, with which he had welcomed the protectorate, playing on his altered countenance, made me in my heart's core feel that this was Raymond. He stretched out to me his other hand. I discerned the trace of manacles on his bared wrist. I heard my sister's sobs and thought, happy are women who can weep and in a passionate caress disburden the oppression of their feelings, shame and, hab and habitual restraint hold back a man. I would have given worlds to have acted as in days of boyhood, to have strained him to my breast, pressed his hand to my lips, and wept over him. My swelling heart choked me. The natural current would not be checked. The big, rebellious tears gathered in my eyes. I turned aside, and they dropped in the sea. They came fast and faster. Yet I could hardly be ashamed, for I saw that the rough sailors were not unmoved, and Raymond's eyes alone were dry from among our crew. He lay in that blessed calm which convalescence always induces, enjoying in secure tranquillities liberty and reunion with her whom he adored. Perdita at length subdued her burst of passion and rose. She looked around for Clara. The child, frightened, not recognizing her father, and neglected by us, had crept to the other end of the boat. She came at her mother's call. Her Perdita presented her to Raymond. Her first words were, Beloved, beloved, embrace our child. Come hither, sweet one. Do you not know me? She knew his voice and cast herself in his arms with half-bashful but uncontrollable emotion. Perceiving the weakness of Raymond, I was afraid of ill consequences from the pressure of the crowd on his landing. But they were awed as I had been at the change of his appearance. The music died away, the shouts abruptly ended, the soldiers had cleared a space in which a carriage was drawn up. He was placed in it. Perdita and Clara entered with him, and the escort closed round it. A hollow murmur akin to the roaring of the near waves went through the multitude. They fell back as the carriage advanced, and fearful of injuring him, they had come to welcome. By loud testimonies of joy, they satisfied themselves, with bending in a low salam as the carriage passed. It went slowly along the road of the Pyrrhus, passed by antique temple and heroic tomb beneath the craggy rock of the citadel. The sound of the waves was left behind, that of the multitude continued at intervals suppressed in horse, and though in the city the horses, churches, and public buildings were decorated with tapestry and banners, though the soldiery lined the streets, and the inhabitants in the thousands were assembled to give him hail, the same solemn silence prevailed, 
the soldiery presented arms, the, bailer, the banners veiled. Many a white hand waved a streamer and vainly sought to discern the hero in the vehicle, which, closed and encompassed by the city guards, drew him to the palace allotted for his abode. Raymond was weak and exhausted, and yet the interest he perceived to be excited on his account filled him with proud pleasure. He was nearly killed with kindness. It is true, the populace restrained themselves, but there arose a perpetual hum and bustle from the throng around the palace, which added to the noise of the fireworks, the frequent explosion of arms, the tramp to and fro of horsemen and carriages, to which effervescence he was the focus, slowed his recovery. So we retired a while to S. Eleusius, and here rest and tender care added each day to the strength of our invalid. The zealous attention of Perdita claimed the first rank in the causes which would induce his rapid recovery, but the second was surely the delight he felt in the affection and good will of the Greeks. We are said in love much those whom we greatly benefit or we we are said to love those whom we greatly benefit, rather. Raymond had fought and conquered for the Athenians. He had suffered on their account. Peril, imprisonment, hardship, their gratitude affected him deeply, and he inly vowed to unite his fate forever to that of a people so enthusiastically dedicated to him. Social feeling and sympathy constituted a marked feature in my disposition. In early youth, the living drama acted around me, drew me heart and soul into its vortex. I was now conscious of a change. I loved, I hoped. I enjoyed, but there was something beside this. I was inquisitive as to the internal principles of action of those around me. Hang on a second. Library is Apologies. I think just the strain of the travel has gotten to him, too. Well, that or his brother won't let him eat. Because Magnus is known to resource guard things. Despite the fact that we've got room in here for one food bowl, one water, water bowl, and one litter box, Magnus seems to think they're only his. Mind you, they've only always had one water bowl and one food bowl. Originally they had two litter boxes, but I don't have the space for that in here. So I just have to be very fastidious with how I clean it. Anyway, I digress a great deal. We had a cut off in the middle of a sentence there. Uh, something about uh, actions of those around me, that's where I was. I was inquisitive as to the internal principles of action of those around me, anxious to read their thoughts justly, and forever occupied in divining their innermost mind. All events at the same time that they deeply interested me arranged themselves in pictures before me. I gave the right place to every personage in the group, the just balance to every sentiment. This undercurrent of thought often soothed me amidst distress and even agony. It gave ideality to that which... Taken, Nathan, taken in naked truth, the soul would have revolted. It bestowed pictorial colors on misery and disease, and not unfrequently relieved me from despair and deplorable, and deplorable changes. The faculty or instinct was now roused. 
I watched the reawakened devotion of my sister, Clara's timid but concentrated admiration of her father, and Raymond's appetite for renown and sensitiveness to the demonstrations of affection of the Athenians. Attentively perusing this animated volume, I was the less surprised at the tale I read on the new turned page. Sorry, I lost my place. There we go. The Turkish army were at this time besieging Rodesto. Rodosto? Rodesto. And the Greeks, hastening their preparations and sending each battle, sending each day reinforcements, were on the eve of forcing the enemy to battle. Each people looked on the coming struggle as that which would be to a great de degree decisive, as in the case of victory, and the next step would be the siege of Constantinople by the Greeks. Raymond, being somewhat recovered, prepared to reassume his command in the army. Perdita did not oppose herself to his determination. She only stipulated to be permitted to accompany him. She had set no down no rule of contact for herself, rather no rule of conduct for herself, but for her life she could not have opposed his slightest wish, or do other than acquiesce cheerfully in all his projects. One word, in truth, had alarmed her more than battles or sieges, during which she had trusted Raymond's high command would exempt him from danger. That word, as yet, was not more to her, was plague. Ooh, plague. That's a familiar word, isn't it? This enemy to the human race had begun early in June to raise its serpent head on the shores of the Nile. Parts of Asia, not usually subject to this evil were infected. It was, at Con it was in Constantinople, but as each year that city experienced a like visitation, small attention was paid to those accounts which declared more people to have died there already than usually made up the accustomed prey of the whole of the hotter months. However, rather, however it may be, neither plague nor war could prevent Perdita from following her, lo following her lord or induce her to utter one objection to the plans which he proposed. To be near him... Sorry, I am... If I'm distracted, it's because I'm keeping one eye on library, because after he pukes, he gets a very... He continues to be very nervous. It's okay, kitty. It's okay. You good? Yeah. Uh, object one. And you said other one. Yeah, there were more. To be near him, to be loved by him, to feel him again her own, was the limit of her desires. The object of her life was to do him pleasure. It had been so before, but with a difference. In past times, without thought or foresight, she made him happy, being so herself, and any question in choice uh, consulted her own wishes as being one with his. Now she, she seditiously put herself out of the question, sacrificing her, even her anxiety for his health and welfare to her resolve to not oppose any of his desires. Love of the Greek people, appetite for glory, and hatred of the barbarian government under which he had suffered even to the approach of death stimulated him. He wished to repay the kindness of the Athenians, to keep alive the splendid associations connected with his name, and to eradicate from Europe a power which, while every other nation advanced in civilization, stood, stood still, a monument of antique barbarism. Having effected the reunion of Raymond and Perdita, I was eager to return to England, but his earnest request added to the awakening curiosity and an indefinable anxiety to behold the catastrophe, now apparently at hand, in the long-drawn history of Grecian and now Turkish warfare. It induced me to consent to prolong until autumn the period of my residence in Greece. As soon as the health of Raymond was sufficiently re-established, he prepared to join the Grecian camp near Kashan, a town of some importance situated to the east of the Hebrus, in which Perdita and Clara were to remain until the event of the expected battle. We quitted Athens on the 2nd of June. 
Raymond had now recovered from the gaunt and pallid looks of fever. If I no longer saw the fresh glow of youth on his matured countenance, if care had besieged his brow and dug deep trenches in his beauty's field, if his hair, slightly mangled with gray, and his look, considerate even in its eagerness, gave signs of added years and past sufferings, yet there was something irresistibly affecting in the sight of one, lately snatched from the grave, renewing his career, untamed by sickness or disaster. The Athenians saw in him, not as heretofore, the heroic boy or desperate man who was ready to die for them, but the prudent commander, who for their sakes was careful of his life, and could make his own warrior propensities second to the scheme of conduct policy might point out. All Athens accompanied us for several miles. When he'd landed a month ago, the noisy populace had been hushed by sorrow and fear, but this, this was a festival day to all. The air resounded with their shouts. Their picturesque costume and the gay colors of which it was composed, it flaunted in the sunshine. Their eager gestures and rapid utterance accorded with their wild appearance. Raymond was the theme of every tongue, the hope of each wife, the mother of a betrothed bride who, whose husband, child, or lover, making a part of the Greek army, were to be conducted to victory by. Notwithstanding the hazardous object of our journey, it was full of romantic interest as we passed through the valleys and over the hills of this divine country. Raymond was inspirited by the intense sensations of recovered health. He felt that in being general of the Athenians he filled a post worthy of his ambitions, and in his hope of the conquest of Constantinople he counted on an event which would be as a landmark in the waste of ages, an exploit unequaled in the annals of man, when a city of grand historic association, the beauty of those who sh of whose she, of whose sight was the wonder of the world, which for many hundred years had been the stronghold of Moslems, that's Moslems with an O, I'm reading it like that on purpose, should be, re should be rescued from slavery and barbarism, and restored to a people of illustrious for genius, civilization, and the spirit of liberty. liberty. Perdita rested on his restored society, on his love, his hopes, and fame, even as a sybarite on a luxurious couch. Every thought was transported, every emotion bathed, as it were, in a congenial and balmy element. We arrived at Kashan on the 7th of July. The weather during our journey had been serene. Each day before dawn, we left our night's encampment and watched the shadows as they retreated from hill and valley and the golden splendor of the sun's approach. The accompanying soldiers received, with national vivacity, enthusiastic pleasure from the sight of beautiful nature. The uprising of the star of day was hailed by triumphant strains, while the birds, heard by snatches, were filled up, were filling up the interval, filled the intervals of music. At noon, we pitched our tents in some shady valley or embowering wood among the among the mountains, while a stream prattling over pebbles induced grateful sleep. Our evening march, more calm, was yet more delightful than the morning restlessness of spirit. If the band played involuntarily, they chose airs of moderated passion. The farewell of love or lamented absence was followed and closed by some solemn hymn, which harmonized with the tranquil loveliness of evening and elevated the soul to grand and religious thought. Often all sounds were suspended that we might listen to the nightingale, while the fireflies danced in bright measure and the soft cooing of the aziolo spoke of fair weather to the traveler. Did we pass a valley? Soft shades encompassed us, and rocks tinged with beauteous hues. If we traversed a mountain, if we traversed a mountain, Greece, a living map, was spread beneath. Her renowned pinnacles cleaving the ether, her rivers threading in silver line the fertile land. Afraid almost to breathe, we English travelers surveyed with ecstasy this splendid landscape so different from the sober hues and melancholy graces of our native scenery. 
When we quitted Macedonia, the fertile but low plains of Thrace offered fewer beauties, and yet our journey continued to be interesting. An advanced guard gave information of our approach, and the country people were quickly in motion to do honor to Lord Raymond. The villages were decorated by triumphal arches of greenery by day, and lamps by night, tapestry waved from the windows, the ground was strewn with flowers, and the name of Raymond joined that of Greece was echoed in, in the aviv of the peasant crowd. When we arrived at Kishon, we learned that on hearing of the advance of Lord Raymond and his detachment, the Turkish army had retreated from Rodosto, but meeting with a reinforcement, they had retrod their steps. In the meantime, Argyro Pilo? Sorry, A R G Y R O P Y L O. Argyro Pilo, the Greek commander in chief, had advanced so as to be between the Turks and Rodosto. A battle, it was said, was inevitable. Perdita and her child were to remain at Kishan. Raymond asked me if I would not continue with them. And now by the fells of Cumberland, I cried, by all the vagabond and poacher that appertains to me, I will stand at your side, draw my sword in the Greek cause, and be hailed as a victor along with you. All the plain from Kishan to Rodosto, a distance of sixteen leagues, was alive with troops or with the camp followers, all in motion at the approach of a battle. The small garrisons were drawn from the various towns and fortresses, and went to swell the main army. We met baggage wagons, and many females of high and low rank returning to Ferry or Kishan, there to wait the issue of the expected day. When we arrived at Rodosto, we found that the field had been taken, and the scheme of the battle arranged. The sound of firing early on the following morning informed us that advanced posts of their armies were engaged. Regiment after regiment advanced, their colors flying and bands playing. They planted the cannon on the tumuli, sole elevations in this level country, and formed themselves in a column in a hollow square, while the pioneers threw up small mounds for their protection. These, then, were the preparations for a battle, nay, THE battle itself, far different from anything the imagination had pictured. We read of center and wing in Greek and Roman history. We fancy a spot, plain as a table, and soldiers small as chessmen, and drawn forth so that the most ignorant of the game can discover science and order in the disposition of the forces. When I came to the reality and saw regiments file off to the left far out of sight, fields intervening between the battalions, but a few troops sufficiently near me to observe their motions, I gave up all the idea of understanding, even of seeing a battle, but attaching myself to Raymond, attended with intense interest to his actions. He showed himself collected, gallant, and imperial. His commands were prompt, his intuition of the events of the day, to me, miraculous. In the meantime, the cannon roared, the music lifted off its enlivening voice at intervals, and we, on the highest of the mounds I mentioned, too far off to observe the fallen sheaves with which death gathered into his storehouse, beheld the regiments, now lost in smoke, now banners and staves peering above the cloud, while shout and clamor drowned every sound. Early in the day, a gropyro... <laughs> Agriro Agri Pilo was wounded dangerously, and Raymond assumed the command of the whole army. He made few remarks till, on observing through the glass the sequel of an order he had given, his face, clouded for a while with doubt, became radiant. The day is ours, he cried. The Turks fly from the bayonet. And then swiftly he dispatched his aide de camp to command the horse to fall on the routed enemy. The defeat became total. The cannon ceased to roar, the infantry rallied, and the horse pursued the flying Turks upon the dreary, uh, along the dreary plain. The staff of Raymond was dispersed in various directions to make observations and bear commands. Even I was dispatched to a distant part of the field. The ground on which the battle was fought was a level plain, so level that from the tumuli you saw the waving line of mountains on the wide-stretched horizon, and yet the intervening space was unvaried by the least irregularity save which undulations has resembled the waves of the sea. The whole of this part of Thrace had been so long a scene of contest that it remained uncultivated, and presented a dreary, barren appearance. 
The order I received was to make an observation of the direction which a detachment of the enemy might have taken from a northern tumulus. The whole Turkish army, followed by the Greek, had poured eastward. None but the dead remained in the direction of my side. From the top of the mound I looked far round, and all was silent and deserted. The last beams of the nearly sunken sun shot up from behind the far summit of Mount Athos. The sea of Marmora still glittered beneath its rays, while the Asiatic coast beyond was half hid in a haze of low cloud. Many a cask and bayonet and sword, fallen from unnerved arms, reflected the departing ray. They lay scattered far and near. From the east a band of ravens, Old inhabitants of the Turkish cemeteries came sailing along toward their harvest. The sun disappeared. This hour, melancholy yet sweet, has always seemed to me the time when we are most naturally led to commune with higher powers. Our mortal sternness departs, and gentle complacency invests the soul. But now, in the midst of the dying and the dead, how could a thought of a heaven or a sensation of tranquility possess one of the murderers? During the busy day, my mind had yielded itself, itself a willing slave to the state of things presented to it by its fellow beings. Historical association, hatred of the foe, and military enthusiasm had held dominion over me. But now, as I looked on the evening star, as so softly and calmly it hung pendulous in the orange hues of sunset, I turned to the corpse-strewn earth and felt ashamed of my species. So, perhaps, were the placid skies, for they quickly veiled themselves in mist, and in this change assisted the swift disappearance of twilight usual in the south. Heavy masses of cloud floated up from the southeast, and red and turbid lightning shot from their dark edges. The rushing wind disturbed the garments of the dead, and was chilled as it passes as over their icy forms. Darkness gathered round, the objects about me became indistinct, I descended from my station, and with difficulty guided my horse as to avoid the slain. Suddenly I heard a piercing shriek. A form seemed to rise from the earth. It flew swiftly towards me, sinking into the ground again as it drew near. All this passed so suddenly that I with difficulty reined in my horse, so that it should not trample on the prostrate being. The dress of this person was that of a soldier, but the bared neck and arms and the continued shrieks discovered a female thus disguised. I dismounted to her aid, while she, with heavy groans and her hand placed on her side, resisted my attempt to lead her on. In the hurry of the moment I forgot that I was in Greece, and my, in my native accents endeavored to soothe the sufferer. With wild and terrific exclamations the lost, dying Evadna, for it was she, recognized the language of her lover. Pain and fever from her wound had deranged her intellects, while her piteous cries and feeble efforts to escape penetrated me with compassion. In her wild delirium she called upon the name of Raymond. She exclaimed that I was keeping him from her, while the Turks, with fearful instruments of torture, were about to take his life. Then again she sadly lamented her hard fate, that a woman with a woman's heart and sensibility should be driven by hopeless love and vacant hopes to take up the trade of arms and suffer beyond the endurance of man, privation, labor, and pain. All the while, her dry, hot hand pressed mine, and her brow and lips burned with consuming fire. As her strength grew less, I lifted her from the ground. Her emaciated form hung over my arm, her sunken cheek rested on my chest, and in a sepulchral voice she murmured, This is the end, my love, and yet not the end and frenzy lent her strength as she cast her arm up to heaven. There is the end. There we meet again. Many living deaths I, I have borne for thee, O Raymond, and now I expire thy victim. By my death I purchase thee. Lo, the instruments of war, fire, the plague, or my servitors. I dared, I conquered them all until now. I have sold myself to death with a sole condition that thou shouldst follow me. Fire and war and plague unite for thy destruction. Oh, my Raymond, there is no safety for thee. With a heavy heart I listened to the changes of her delirium. I made her a bed of cloaks. Her violence decreased, and a clammy dew stood on her brow as the paleness of death succeeded to the crimson of fever. I placed her on the cloaks. She continued to rave of her speedy meeting 
with her beloved in the grave of his death nigh at hand. Sometimes she solemnly declared that he was summoned. Sometimes she bewailed his hard destiny. Her voice grew feebler, her speech interrupted, a few convulsive movements and her muscles finally relaxed. The limbs fell, no more to be sustained, one deep sigh, and the life was gone. I bore her from the near neighborhood of the dead. Wrapped in cloaks, I placed her beneath a tree. Once more I looked on her altered face. The last time I saw her, she was eighteen, beautiful as a poet's vision, splendid as a sultana of the East. Twelve years had passed, twelve years of change, sorrow, and hardship. Her brilliant complexion had become worn and dark. Her limbs had lost the roundness of youth and womanhood. Her eyes had sunken deeply. Crushed and o'erworn, the hours had drained her blood and filled her brow with lines and wrinkles. With shuddering horror, I veiled this monument of human passion and human misery. I heaped over her all the flags and heavy accoutrement I could find to guard her from birds and beasts of prey until I could bestow on her a fitting grave. Sadly and slowly, I stemmed my course from among the heaps of slain and, guided by the twinkling lights of the town, at length reached Rodosto. Oh, there's little citations for uh, the quotations made there uh, that I'm not sure I pointed out where the quotations were uh, audibly. Uh, you'll have to look at the actual book itself, uh, which will be in the show notes. Um, for those of you reading it in a uh, ebook reader, you can just kind of download the file. Uh, we're at position 386.3, .3, right before chapter 2 of volume 2. So that makes it a little easier for those of you who are reading it elsewise. <laughs> Give me just a moment and we'll start in on chapter 2. All right, let's dive into chapter two, shall we? On my arrival, I found that an order had already gone forth for the army to proceed immediately toward Constantinople, and the troops, which had suffered least in the battle, were already on their way. The town was full of tumult. The wound and, the wound and consequent inability of Agropilo had caused Raymond to be first in command. He rode through the town, visiting the wounded, and giving as such orders were as necessary for the siege he mediated. Early in the morning, the whole army was in motion. In the hurry, I could hardly find an opportunity to bestow the last offices on Evadna. Attended only by my servant, I dug a deep grave for her at the foot of the tree, and without disturbing her warrior shroud, I placed her in it, heaping stones upon the grave. The dazzling sun and glare of daylight deprived the scene of solemnity. From Evadna's low tomb, I joined Raymond and his staff, now on their way to the Golden City. Constantinople was invested, 
trenches dug and advances made. The whole Greek fleet blockaded it by sea, on land from the river Kyatkanach. Wait, could, yeah, is that a second H there? Yeah, Kyatkanach. From near the street, sweet waters to the Tower of Memora, on the shores of the Propontis, along the whole line of the ancient walls, the trenches of the siege were drawn. We already possessed Para, the Golden Horn itself, the city bastion by the sea, and ivy-mantled walls of the Greek emperors was all of Europe that the Mah Mahometans could call theirs. Our army looked on her as a certain prey. They counted the garrison. It was impossible that it should be relieved. Each sally was a victory, for even when the Turks were triumphant, the loss of men they had sustained was an irreparable injury. I rode one morning with Raymond to the lofty mound, not far from the top capo, the cannon gate, on which Mahamoud placed his standard and first saw the city. Still the same lofty domes and minarets towered above the venerous walls, virtuous walls, rather, where Constantine had died and the Turk had entered the city. The plain, the plain around was interspersed with cemeteries, Turk, Greek, Armenian, with their growth of cypress trees and other woods of more cheerful aspect, diversifying the scene. Among them the Greek army was encamped, and in their squadrons moved to and fro, now in regular march, now in swift career. Library. You gotta leave that door alone, baby. Yeah, I know. Raymond's eyes were fixed on the city. I have counted the hours of her life, said he. One month and she falls. Remain with me until then. Wait till you see the cross in St. Sophia, and then return to your peaceful glades. You, then? Uh, you'll still remain in Greece? Assuredly. Yet, Lionel, when I say this, believe me, I look back with regret on our tranquil life at Windsor. I am but a half a soldier. I love the renown, but not the trade of war. Before the Battle of Rodosto, I was full of hope and spirit to conquer there, and afterwards to Constantinople to take it was the hope of the born, the fulfillment of my ambition. The enthusiasm is now spent. I know not why. I seem to myself to be entering a darksome gulf. The ardent spirit of the army is irksome to me, the rapture of triumph nullified. He paused for a moment and was lost in thought. His serious mien recalled by some association the half-forgotten Evadna to my mind, and I seized this opportunity to make enquiries from him concerning her strange lot. I asked him if he had ever seen among the troops anyone resembling her, if since she had returned to Greece he had heard of her. He started at her name and looked uneasily on me. Even so, I knew you'd speak of her. Long, long had I forgotten her. Since our encampment here, she daily, hourly visits my thoughts. When I'm addressed, her name is the sound I expect. In every communication, I imagine that she'll form a part. At length, you have broken the spell. Tell me what you know of her. I related my meeting with her. The story of her death was told and retold. With painful earnestness, he questioned me regarding her prophecies, concerning them, concerning how they related to him. I treated them as the ravings of a maniac. No, no, do not deceive yourself. Me, you cannot. She has said nothing but what I knew before, though this is confirmation. Fire, the sword, and the plague, they may all be found in yonder city. On my head alone may they fall. From this day, Raymond's melancholy increased. He secluded himself as much as the duties of his station permitted. When in company, sadness would, in spite of every effort, steal over his features, and he sat absent and mute among the busy crowd that thronged about him. Perdita rejoined him, and before her he forced himself to appear cheerful, for she, even as a mirror, changed as he changed. And if he were silent and anxious, she solicity, solicitously inspired concern in, and endeavored to remove the cause of his seriousness. She resided at the, pla the palace of sweet waters, a summer seraglio of the sultan. The beauty of the surrounding scenery, undefiled by war and the freshness of the river, made this spot doubly delightful. 
Raymond felt no relief, received no pleasure from any show of heaven or earth. He often left Perdita to wander in the grounds alone, or in a light shallop, he floated idly on the pure waters, musing deeply. Sometimes I joined him. At such times his countenance was invariably solemn, his air dejected. He seemed relieved on seeing me, and would talk with some degree of interest on the affairs of the day. There was evidently something behind all of this, yet when he appeared about to speak of that which was nearest his heart, he would abruptly turn away, and with a sigh endeavor to d deliver the painful idea to the winds. It had often occurred that when I has, when, as I had said, Raymond quitted Perdita's drawing room, Clara came up to me, and gently drawing me aside, said, Papa is gone. Shall we go to him? I dare say he'll be glad to see you. And as accident permitted, I complied with or refused her request. One evening, a numerous assembly of Greek chieftains was gathered together in the palace. The intriguing Pali, the accomplished Caraza, the warlike Ypsilanti were among the principal. They talked of the events of the day, the skirmish at noon, the diminished numbers of the infidels, their defeat and fight. They contemplated, after a short interval of time, the capture of the Golden City. They endeavored to picture forth what would happen and spoke in lofty terms of the prosperity of Greece when Constantinople should become its capital. The conversation then reverted to Asiatic intelligence and the ravages the plague had made in its chief cities. Conjectures were hazarded as, as to the progress the disease might have made to the besieged city. Raymond had joined the former part of the discussion, and in lively terms he demonstrated the extremities to which Constant Constantinople was reduced. The wasted and haggard, the through ferocious, though ferocious at the appearance of the troops. Famine and pestilence was the work for them, he observed, and the infidels would be obliged to take refuge in their only hope, submission. Suddenly, in the midst of his harangue, he broke off as if stung by some painful thought. He rose uneasily, and I perceived him at length quit the hall, and through the long corridor seek the open air. He did not return, and soon Clara crept round me, making the accustomed invitation. I consented to her request, and, taking her little hand, followed Raymond. We found him just about to embark in his boat, and he readily agreed to receive us as companions. After the heats of the day, the cooling land breeze ruffled the river and filled our little sail. The city looked dark to the south, while the numerous lights along the near shores and the beautiful aspect of the banks reposing in placid night, the waters keenly reflecting the heavenly lights, gave to this beauteous river a dower of loveliness that night that, that might have been characterized a retreat in paradise. A single boatsman attended to the sail. Raymond steered, Clara sat at his feet, clasping his knees with her arms and laying her head on them. Raymond began the conversation somewhat abruptly. This, my friend, is the last time we shall have an opportunity of conversing freely. My plans are now in full operation, and my time will become more and more occupied. Besides, I wish at once to tell you my wishes and expectations, and then never again to revert so painful a subject. First, I must thank you, Lionel, for having remained here at my request. Vanity first prompted me to ask you. Vanity, I call it, and yet even in this I see the hand of fate. Your presence will soon be necessary. You'll become the last resource of Perdita, her protector and her consoler. You will take her back to Windsor. Not without you. You don't mean to separate again? Do not deceive yourself. The operation at hand is one over which I have no control. Most near at hand is it. The days... That is to say, the days are already counted. May I trust you? For many days I have longed to disclose the mysterious presentiments that weigh on me, although I fear that you will ridicule them. Yet do not, my gentle friend, for all childish and unwise as they are, they have become a part of me, and I dare not expect to shake them off. Yet how can I expect you to sympathize with me? You're of this world. I'm not. You hold forth your hand. It is as e it is ever. It is 
even a part of yourself, and you do not divide the feeling of identity from the mortal that sh for mortal form that shapes your form. That sh Let's try that entire sentence again, shall we? Uh, you do not yet divide the feeling of identity from the mortal form that shapes forth life. How then can you understand? Earth is to me a tomb. He said, and the page didn't turn. Earth is to me a tomb, the firmament of vault, shrouding more corruption. Time is no more, for I have stepped within the threshold of eternity. Each man I meet appears a corpse, which will soon be deserted of, it, deserted of its animating spark on the eve of decay and corruption. Cada pietra un pyramente levanta, y cada flor construye un momento, cada edificio es un sepulcro altivo, cada soldado en un escuelto vivo. His accent was mournful. He sighed deeply. A few months ago, I was thought to be dying. My life was strong within me. My affections were human. Hope and love were the day stars of my life. Now they dream that the brows of the conqueror of the infidel faith are about to be encircled by triumphant laurel. They talk of honorable reward of title, power, and wealth. All I ask of Greece is a grave. Let them raise a mound above my lifeless body, which may stand even when the dome of St. Sophia has fallen. Wheretofore do I feel thus? At Rodesto I was full of hope, but when I first saw Constantinople, that feeling with every other joyful one departed. The last words of Evadne were the seal upon the warrant of my death, yet I do not pretend to account for my mood by any particular event. All I can say is that it is so. This plague that I am told is in Constantinople. Perhaps I have imbibed its effluvia. Perhaps disease is the real cause of my prognostications. It matters little why or wherefore I am afflicted. No power can avert the stroke, and the shadow of fate's uplifted hand already darkens me. To you, Lionel, I entrust your sister and her child. Never mention to her the fatal name of Evadna. She would doubly, star doubly sorrow over the strange link that enchains me to her, making my spirit obey her dying voice, following her, as it is about to do. To the unknown country. I listened to him with wonder, but that his sad demeanor and a solemn utterance assured me of the truth and intensity of his feelings, I should, with light derision, have attempted to dissipate his fear. Whatever I was about to reply was interrupted by the powerful emotions of Clara. Raymond had spoken, thoughtless of her presence, and she, the poor child, heard with terror and faith the prophecy of his death. Her father was so moved by her violent grief that he took her in his arms and soothed her, but his very soothings were still solemn and fearful. Weep not, my sweet child. The coming death of me you've hardly known. I may die. But in death I will never forget or desert my own Clara. In, after sorrow and joy, believe that your father's spirit is near to save or sympathize with you. Be proud of me and cherish your infinite remembrance of me. Thus, sweetest, I appear not to die. One thing you must promise not to speak to anyone but your uncle of the conversation which you have just overheard. When I'm gone, you will console your mother and tell her the death that was only bitter because it divided me from her. That my last thoughts will be spent on her. But while I live, promise not to betray me. Promise, my child. With faltering accents, Clara did promise, while she still clung to her father in a transport of sorrow. Soon we returned to shore, and I endeavored to obviate the impression made on the child's mind by treating Raymond's fears lightly. We heard no more of them, for, as he had said, the siege, now drawing to a conclusion, became paramount in interest, engaging all of his time and, and attention. The empire of the Mahometans in Europe was at its close. 
the Greek fleet blockading, blockading every part of Stamboul pre prevented the arrival of succor from Asia. All egress on the side toward land had become impractical, except to such desperate sallies, as reduced the numbers of the enemy without making any impression on our lives. The garrison was now... <clears throat> <clears throat> the garrison was now diminished, that it was evident that the city could have easily been carried by storm, but both humanity and policy dictated a slower mode of proceeding. We could hardly doubt that if pushed to the utmost, its palaces, its temples and store of wealth would be destroyed in the fury of connecting, contending triumph and defeat. Already the defenseless citizens had suffered through the barbarity of the Janissaries? Genis yeah, Janissaries. And in time of storm, tumult and massacre, beauty, infancy, and decrepitude would have been alike sacrificed to the brutal ferocity of the soldiers. Famine and blockade were certain means of conquest, and on there we founded our hopes of victory. If the page would turn... Each day, the soldiers of the garrison assaulted our advance posts and impeded the accomplishment of our works. Fire boats were launched from the various ports, while our troops sometimes recoiled from the devoted courage of men who did not seek to live but to sell their lives dearly. These contests were aggravated by the season. They took place during summer, when the southern Asiatic had become laden with intolerable heat, where the streams had dried up in their shallow beds and the, vase, and the vast basin of the sea appeared to glow under the unmitigated rays of the, of the celestial sun. Nor did night refresh the earth. Dew was denied. Herbage and flowers were there, were there none, as the trees drooped, and summer assumed the blighted appearance of winter, as it went forth in silence and, all f and flame to abridge the means of sentence to man. In vain did the eyes strive to find the wreck of some concern. Claude and the stainless Empyrean, which might bring hope. Of change and moisture, the oppressive and windless atmosphere. All was serene, burning, annihilating. We, the besiegers, were in comparison little affected by these evils. The woods around us afforded shade. The river secured to us a constant supply of water. Nay, detachments were employed in furnishing the army with ice, which had been laid up on Hamus and Athos in the mountains of Macedonia, while cooling fruits and wholesome food renovated the strength of the laborers and made us bear with less impatience the weight of the unrefreshing air. But in the city, things wore a different face. The sun's rays were refracted from the pavement and buildings, the stoppage of the public fountains, the bad quality of the food, and scarcity even of that, produced a state of suffering which was aggravated by the scourge of disease. While the garrison attempted every superfluity to them by themselves, adding by waste and riot to the necessary rules of the time, and yet still they would not capitulate. Suddenly the system of warfare was changed. We experienced no more assaults, and by day and by night we continued our labors unimpeded. Stranger still, when the troops advanced near the city, the walls were vacant, and no cannon was pointed against the intruders. When these circumstances were reported to Raymond, he caused minute observations as to what he caused minute observations to be made as to what would he, what was doing inside the walls, and when his scouts returned, reporting only the continued silence and desolation of the city, he commanded the army to be drawn out before the gates. No one appeared in the walls. The very portals, though locked and barred, seem unguarded, and above the many domes and glittering crescents of pierced heaven, while the odd walls, survivor of ages, with ivory crown tower and weed tangled buttress, stood as rocks in an uninhabited waste. From within the city, there was neither shout nor cry, nor aught except the occasional howling of a dog to broke the noonday stillness. Even our shoulders, even our soldiers were awed to silence. The music paused, the clang of arms was hushed. 
Each man, each man asks his fellow in whispers the meaning of the sudden peace, while Raymond, from a height, endeavored, by means of glasses, to discover and observe the stratagem of his enemy. No form could be discern, discerned on the terrace of the houses. The higher parts of town, no living shadow, bespoke the presence of any living being. The very trees waved not, and mocked the stability of the architecture with like immovability. The tramp of horses, distinctly heard in silence, was at length disturbed. It was a troop sent by Caraza, the admiral. The admiral. They bore dispatches to the Lord General. The contents of these papers were important. The night before, the watch on board one of the small vessels, anchored near the Seraglio wall, was roused by a slight splash, splashing as of muffled oars. The alarm was given. Twelve small boats, each containing three Janizaries. Janizaries? Uh, whatever. Were described endeavoring to make their way through the fleet to the opposite shore of Scutari. When they found themselves discovered, they discharged their muskets, and, soon, and some came to the front to cover the others, while whose crews, exerting all their strength, endeavored to escape with their light barks from among the dark halls that envisioned them. They... They were in the end all sunk, and with the exception of two or three prisoners, the crews drowned. Little could be got from the survivors, but their cautious answers caused it to be surmised that this several expeditions had preceded this last, and several Turks of rank and importance had been conveyed to Asia. The men most disdainfully repelled the idea of having deserted the defense of their city, and one, the youngest among them, in answer to the taunt of a sailor, exclaimed, Take it, Christian dogs! Take the palaces, the gardens, the mosques, the abode of our fathers. Take plague with them. Your te the pestilence is the enemy we fight. If she be your friend, hug her to the, your bosoms. The curse of Allah is on Stamboul. Share your fate. Such was the account sent by Caraza to Raymond, but a tale full of monstrous exaggerations, though founded on this, was spread by the accompanying troop among our soldiers. A murmur arose. The city was the prey of pestilence. Already had admired mighty powder, mighty power rather, subjugated the inhabitants. Death had become lord of Constantinople. I have heard a picture described wherein all the inhabitants of the earth were drawn out in fear to stand the encounter of death. The feeble and decrepit fled. The warriors retreated, though they threatened even in flight. Wolves and lions, various monsters of the desert roared against him, while the grim unreality hovered, shaking his spectral dart, a solitary but invincible assa assailant. Even so was it with the army of Greece. I am convinced that the myriad troops of Asia come from over the Propontis and stood defenders of the Golden City. Each and every Greek would have marched against the overwhelming numbers and devoted himself with patriotic fury for his country. But there was no hedge of bayonets opposing itself, no death-dealing artillery, no formidable array of brave, brave soldiers. The unguarded walls forded easy entrance, the vacant places, luxurious dwellings. But above the, som the dome of St. Sophia, the superstitious Greeks saw a pestilence and shrunk in trepidation from her influence. Raymond was actuated by other feelings. He descended the hill with a face beaming with triumph, and pointing his sword to the gates, commanded his troops to chop down, to down with those barricades, the only obstacles, now to complete his victory. The soldiers answered his cheerful words with aghast and awestruck looks. Instinctively they drew back, and Raymond rode in the front of the lines. By my sword I swear that no ambush or strategy men dangerous here. The enemy's already vanquished, the pleasant pleasant places, the noble dwellings and spoil of the city are already yours. Force the gate, enter and possess the seats of your ancestors, your own inheritance. A universal shudder and fearful whispering passed through the lines. Not a soldier moved. Cowards, exclaimed the general, exasperated. Give me a hatchet. I'll alone will enter. I will plant your standard when you see it wave from yon highest minaret. You may gain courage and rally round it.
One of his officers now came forward. The general, we fear neither the courage nor the arms, the open attack, or secret ambush of the Moslems. We're ready to expose our breasts, exposed ten thousand times before, to the balls and scimitars of the infidels, and to fall gloriously for Greece, but we will not die in heaps like dogs poisoned in summertime. By the pestilential air of this city, we dare not go against the plague. A multitude of men are feeble and inert. Without voice, a leader, give them that, and they regain the strength belonging to their numbers. Shouts from a thousand voices now rent the air. The cry of applause became universal. Raymond saw the danger. He was willing to save his troops from the crime of disobedience, for he knew the contention once begun with the commander and his army, each act and word bestowed on the weakness of the former and bestowed power on the latter. He gave orders for the retreat to be sounded, and the regiments repaired in good order for the camp. I hastened to carry the intelligence of those strange proceedings to Brigitte, and we were soon joined by Raymond. He looked gloomy and perturbed, and my sister was struck by my narrative. How beyond the imaginations of man are the decrees of heaven wondrous and inexplicable? Foolish girl, cried Raymond angrily. Are you like my valiant soldiers, panic-struck? What is there inexplicable, pray tell me, in so very natural occurrence? Does not the plague rage each year in Stamboul? What wonder is that this year, when, as we are told, its virulence is unexampled in Asia, that it should have occasioned double havoc in that city? What wonder, then, in time of siege, want, extreme heat and drought, that it should make unaccustomed ravages? Less wonder far is it that the garrison, despairing of being able to hold out longer, should take advantage of the negligence of our fleet to escape at once from siege and capture. It is not pestilence by the god that lives, it is not either plague or impending danger that makes us like birds in harvest time scared by a scarecrow, abstaining from the ready prey for our terror. It is base superstition, and thus the aim of the valiant has made the shuttlecock of fools, the worthy ambition of the high soul, the plaything of these tamed hares. Not yet Stamboul shall be ours. Be my past labors, by torture and imprisonment suffered for them, by my victories, by my sword, I swear, by my hopes of fame, to my former deserts now awaiting their reward, I deeply vow with, ha with these hands to plant the cross on yonder, yonder mosque. Dearest Raymond, interrupted Perdita in a supplicant accent. He had been walking to and fro in the marble hall of Seraglio. His lips were pale with rage, while quivering they shaped his angry words. His eyes shot fire, his gestures seemed restrained by their very vehemence. Perdita, he continued impatiently, I know what you would say, I know that you love me, that you are good and gentle, but this is no woman's work, nor can a female heart guess the hurricane which tears me. He seemed half ahead of his own violence, and suddenly quitted the hall. A look from Perdita showed me her distress, and I followed him. He was pacing the garden. His passions were in a state of inconceivable turbulence. Why, forever to be in the sport of fortune, must man, the heaven-climber, be forever the victim of crawling reptiles of his species? Were I, as you, Lionel, looking forward to many years of life, to a succession of love-enlightened days, to refined enjoyments and fresh springing hopes, I might yield and break my general staff, seek repose in the glades of Windsor, but I am about to die. Nay, interrupt me not. Soon I shall die. From the many people of earth, from the sympathies of man, from the loved resorts of my youth, from the kindness of my friends, from the affection of my only beloved Perdita, I am about to be removed. Such is the will of fate, such is the decree of the high ruler from whom there is no, no appeal, to whom I submit. But to lose all, to lose with life and love, glory also, it shall not be. I, in a few brief years, all you, this panic-struck army, and the population of fair Greece will no longer be. But other generations will arise, and ever and forever will continue to be made happier by our present access, to be glorified by our valor. The prayer of my youth was to be one among those who render the pages of Earth's history splendid, who exalt the race of man, and make this little globe a dwelling of the mighty. Alas, for Raymond, the prayer of his youth is wasted. The hopes of his manhood are null. From my dungeon in yonder city I cried, Soon I will be their lord. 
When Evadna pronounced my death, I thought the title of Victor of Constantinople would be written on my throne, and I subdued all mortal fear. I stand before its vanquished walls, and do not call myself a conqueror. So shall it not be. Did not Alexander leap from the walls of the city of Oxyhydrache to show his coward troops the way to victory, entering alone the swords of its defenders? Even so, I will brave the plague, and though no man follow, I will plant the Grecian standard on the height of St. Sophia. Reason came on availing to such high-wrought feelings. In vain I showed him that when winter came, the cold, will, the, cold would dis, the cold would dissipate the pestilential air and return courage to the Greeks. Talk not of any other, talk not of any other season than this, he cried. I have lived my last winter, and the date of this year, 2092, will be carved upon my tomb. Already do I see, he continued, looking up mournfully, the born and precipitate edge of my universe, over which I am to plunge into the gloomy mystery of the life to become. I am prepared so that I may leave behind a trail of light so radiant that my worst enemies cannot cloud it. I owe this to Greece, to you, to my surviving Perdita, and to myself the victim of ambition. We were interrupted by an attendant who announced that the staff of Raymond was assembled in the council chamber. He requested me in the meantime to ride through the camp and observe and report to him the dispositions of the soldiers. He then left me. I had been excited to the utmost by the proceedings of the day, and now more than ever by the passionate language of Raymond. Alas, for human reason, he accused the Greeks of superstition. What name did he give to the faith that he lent to the predictions of Evadna? I passed from the palace of sweet waters to the plain on which the encampment lay, and found its inhabitants in commotion. The arrival of several with fresh stories and marvels from the fleet, the exaggerations bestowed on what was already known, tales of old prophecies, of fearful histories of whole regions who had been laid waste during the present year by pestilence, armed and reoccupied the troops. Discipline was lost, the army disbanded itself. Each individual, before a part of its great moving only in each individual, before a part of a great whole moving only in unison with others, knew now became resolved into the unit nature. Sorry, the unit nature had made him and thought of himself only. They stole off at first by ones and twos, and then other companies, larger companies, impeded by the officers. The whole battalions sought the road that led to Macedonia. About midnight I returned to the palace and sought Raymond. He was alone and apparently composed. Such composure, at least, was his as is inspired by a resolve to adhere to a certain line of conduct. He heard my account of the self-dissolution of the army with calmness and then said, You know, Verney, my fixed determination not to quit this place until the light of day stand is confessedly ours. If the men I have about me shrink from following me, others more courageous to be found. Go before you break of go before you break of day. Bear these dispatches to Caraza, add them to their add them to your own entreaties if he send his marines and naval force. If I can't if I can get but one regiment to surround me, the rest would follow, of course. Let me s let him send me this regiment. I shall expect your return by tomorrow noon. Library. Baby. Come here. Come here. Picking you up for your crimes. Come here, little man. The world has to see your toe beads, because you've been a bad and naughty boy. Oh. See, Library is much less, uh, much less accepting of the fact that he's been a bad boy. So he tries to squirm a lot. Don't you, baby? Oh! I give you a smooch on top of the head, and you return with, with claws into my forehead, huh? He's like, Dad, I will not be humiliated. Yeah. Too bad. Your honor and your beans are exposed. For you have been a bad and naughty boy. He looks so upset. <laughs> okay. You've learned your lesson. Blunk. 
Tell you what, folks, uh, that's actually, it's not a chapter boundary, but I think we've, uh, we've got a little ways to, 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 yeah, we've got a, we've got a good ways before the next chapter, I think. Oh, I've completely lost where I was. Uh, discipline was lost. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm... I doubt we are at a good chapter boundary, but this is a good place to stop. We're about an hour in. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go take a quick break. Grab some water, uh, grab some food if you haven't had any... If you are... Grab some food if you're hungry, grab some water if you're thirsty. If you have some medications you need to remember to take, now would be a fantastic time for that. Uh, if you've been sitting along with me this whole time, uh, now would be a great time to get up and stretch. It's never good for you to, uh, you know, sit for too prolonged of a time. Uh, we will be right back. I'm going to grab myself some water, maybe get up and wander around a little bit. I'm getting a little, a little snoozy, but we will be back uh, to continue uh, for at least another hour. But until then, uh, be right back.
Okay, I got myself some water. I did some stretches. Uh, hopefully, I'm a little more awake. Uh, before we dive back into the th back into the tale, uh, I would like to apologize for uh, this plague creeping up uh, in the in the book. I did not know that was there. <laughs> Uh, in initially finding this book, I just uh, looked up, oh, what else had Mary Shelley done? And uh, this was listed as a dystopian novel, and I and I went, hmm, a dystopian novel written at the time of Mary Shelley? That's super early. Let's see if it does anything interesting. I did not know it was going to do a plague. That's kind of a loaded theme right now, <laughs> considering we're in the... We we here in the United States are in the second half of the uh, current plague TM. Uh, so that's a bit of a loaded topic. My apologies if I'd have known that was coming. I'd have tossed like a content warning <laughs> out front of a couple of, uh, out front of this episode, uh, and I still might edit that into the podcast recording. We'll see. Uh, either way. You know, it might wind up being handled in a way that is cathartic to us as a modern, as a modern plague, plague go, plague goer, plague survivor, plague liver. We haven't all survived it. We're not done with it yet. But I, I think survivor, plague experiencer. Anyway, <laughs> the fact that I cannot find the word for what we need is rarely a shock. What do you think, Library? He says, I don't know. I got problems to cause. Yeah. Can you keep the problems to a minimum for another... Mm, hour? <laughs> He's like, I don't know about that. Maybe an hour and a half? Mm, I'm real bad at time. Yeah. I think he really wants me to go to bed. <laughs> Uh, this might wind up being a little bit of a shorter episode. Uh, it seems like the uh, the drive home, even though I was only uh, there for a third of it, uh, other people were driving the other two thirds. Um, you know, it, it, I think it kind of wore on me a little more than I was expecting. Oh, I hope that's my brother pulling me into the driveway, because otherwise we have a problem. Uh, judging from the tone of that engine, that's gotta be my brother. Or someone else driving a diesel. Either way. We're busy. We're reading. I've digressed a great deal. You can stay here, Library. It's okay. It's alright. You can stay here. Where were we? I expect your return by tomorrow noon. Is that where we were? Uh, after my fixed determination. Till in the light of day, the rest would follow, of course. Yeah, sure. Uh, me thought of this. Me thought this was but a for poor exper expedient. I assured him of my obedience and zeal. I quitted him to take a few hours rest. With the breaking of the morning, I was accoutred for my ride. I lingered a while, desirous of taking leave of Perdita, and from my window I was observed the approach of the sun. The golden splendor arose, and weary nature awoke to suffer yet another day of heat and thirsty decay. No flowers lifted up their dew-laden cups to meet the dawn. The dry grass had withered on the plains. The burning fields of air were vacant of birds. The Chacal alone, children of the sun, began their shrill and deafening song among the cypresses and olives. I saw Raymond's coal-black charger brought to the palace gate. A small company of officers arrived soon after. Care and fear was painted on each cheek, and in each eye, unrefreshed by sleep. I found Raymond and Perdita together. He was watching the rising sun while with one arm he encircled his beloved's waist. She looked on him, the sun of her life, with earnest gaze of mingled anxiety and tenderness. Raymond started angrily when he saw me. Here still is this your promise to zeal. Pardon me, but even as you speak I am gone. Nay, pardon me, I have no right to command a reproach, but my life hangs on your departure and your speedy return. Farewell. His, vo his voice had recovered its bland tone, but a dark cloud still hung on his features. 
I would have delayed. I wish to recommend watchfulness to Perdita, but his presence restrained me. I had no pretense for my hesitations, and on his repeating his farewell, I clasped his outstretched hand. It was cold and clammy. Take, take care of yourself, my dear lord. Nay, that task shall be mine. Return speedily, Lionel. With an air of absence, he was playing with her auburn locks while she leaned on him. Twice I turned back only to look again on this matchless pair. At last, with slow and heavy steps, I had paced out of the hall and sprung upon my horse. At that moment, Clara flew towards me, clasping my knee. She cried, Make haste back, uncle. Dear uncle, I have such fearful dreams. I dare not tell my mother. Do not be long away. I assured her of my impatience to return, and then with a small escort, rode along the plain toward the tower of Marmora. I fulfilled my commission. I saw Caraza. He was somewhat surprised he would see, he said, what could be done, but it is required time, and Raymond had ordered me to return by noon. It was impossible to effect anything in so short a time. I must stay until the next day, or come back after having reported the present state of things to the general. My choice was easily made. A relentlessness, a restlessness even, a fear what was about to betide, a doubt as to Raymond's purposes urged me to return without delay to his quarters. Quitting the Seven Towers, I rode eastward toward the Sweet Waters. I took a circuitous path, principally for the sake of going to the top of the mount before mentioned, which commanded a view of the city. I had my glass with me. The city basked under the noonday sun, and the venerable walls formed its picturesque boundary. Immediately before me was the top capo, the gate which Mahomet had made the breach by which he had entered the city. Trees gigantic and aged grew near before the gate. I discerned a crowd of moving human figures. With intense curiosity, I lifted my glass to my eye. I saw Lord Raymond on his charger. A small company of officers had gathered about him and behind him was a promiscuous concourse of soldiers and subalterns, their discipline lost, their arms thrown aside. No music sounded, no banners streamed. The only flag carried among them was the one which Raymond carries. He pointed with it to the gate of the city. The circle round him fell back, and with angry gestures he leapt from his horse, and seizing a hatchet that hung from his saddle-brow, went with the apparent intention of battering down the opposing gate. A few men came to aid him. Their numbers increased. Under their united blows, the obstacle was vanquished. Gate, portcullis, and fence were demolished. And the wide, sunlit way, leading to the heart of the city, now lay open before them. The men shrank back. They seemed afraid of what they had already done, and stood as if they expected some mighty phantom to stalk an offended majesty from the opening. Raymond sprung lightly on his horse, grasped the standard, and with words I could not hear, but his gestures, being in their fit accompaniment, were marked by passionate energy. He seemed to adjure their assistance and companionship. Even as he spoke, the crowd receded from him. Indignation now transported him. His words, I guessed, were fraught with disdain. Then, turning from his coward followers, he addressed himself to enter the city alone. His very horse seemed to back from the fatal entrance. His dog, his faithful dog, lay moaning and supplicating in his path, in a moment more he'd plunged into the in the rowels of the sides of the stung animal, who bounded forward, and he, the gateway past, was galloping up the broad and deserted street. Up until this moment my soul had been in my eyes only. I'd gazed with wonder, mixed with fear and enthusiasm. The latter feeling now predominated. I forgot the distance between us. I will go with thee, Raymond. I cried, but my eye removed from the glass, I could scarce discern the pygmy forms of the crowd, which about a mile from me surrounded the gate. The form of Raymond was lost. Stung with impatience, I urged my horse with a force of spur and, loosened re and lucid reins down the acclivity, that before danger could arrive I might be at the side of my noble, godlike friend. A number of buildings and trees intervened when I had reached the plain, hiding the city from my view, but at that moment a crash was heard. Thunder like it reverberated through the sky, while the air was darkened. A moment more, and the old walls again met my sight, while over them hovered a murky cloud. 
Fragments of buildings whirled above, half seen in smoke, while flames burst out beneath, and continued explosions filled the air with terrific thunders. Flying from the mass of falling ruin which leapt over the high walls and shook the ivy towers, a crowd of soldiers made for the road by which I came. I was surrounded, hemmed in by them, unable to get forward. My impatience rose to its utmost. I stretched out my hands to the men. I conjured them to turn back and save their general, the conqueror of Stamboul, the liberator of Greece. Tears, high tears, to warm flow gushed my eyes. I would not believe in, the dis in his destruction, and yet every mass that darkened the air seemed to hear with it a portion of the martyred Raymond. Horrible sights were shaped to me in the turbid cloud that hovered over the city, and my only relief was derived from the struggles I made to approach the gate. Yet when I effected my purpose, all I could discern within the precincts of the massive walls was a city of fire. The open way through which Raymond had ridden was enveloped in smoke and flame. After an interval, the explosions ceased, but the flames still shot up from various quarters. The dome of St. Sophia had disappeared. Strange to say, the result, perhaps, of the concussion of air occasioned by the blowing up of the city, huge white thunderclouds lifted themselves up over the southern horizon and gathered overhead. They were the first blots on a blue expanse that I had seen for months, and amidst this havoc and despair, they inspired pleasure. The vault above became uh, obscured. Lightning flashed from the heavy masses, followed instantaneously by crashing thunder, and then the big rain fell. The flames of the city bent beneath it, and the smoke and dust arising from the ruins was dissipated. I no sooner perceived an abatement of the flames than... Hurried on by an irresistible impulse, I endeavored to penetrate the town. I could only do this on foot, as the mass of ruin was impracticable for a horse. I had never entered the city before, and its ways were unknown to me. The streets were blocked up, the ruins smoking. I climbed up one heap, only to view others in succession, and nothing told me where the center of the town might be, or towards what point Raymond might have directed his course. The rain ceased, the clouds sunk below the horizon, it was now evening, and the sun descended swiftly in the western sky. I scrambled on until I came to a street whose wooden homes, half burnt, had been cooled by the rain, and were fortunately uninjured by the gunpowder. Up this I hurried, until now I had not seen a vestige of a man, and yet none of the defaced human forms which I distinguished could clearly be Raymond, so I turned my eyes away while my heart sickened within me. I came to an open space, a mountain of ruin in the midst, announced that some large mosque had occupied the space. And here, scattered about, I saw various articles of luxury and wealth, singed, destroyed, but showing what they had been in their ruin. Jewels, strings of pearls, embroidered robes, rich furs, glittering tapestries, ornamental ornaments, oriental ornaments even, seemed to have been collected here in a pile destined for destruction, but the rain had stopped that havoc midway. Hours passed while in the scene of ruin I sought for Raymond. Insurmountable hopes sometimes opposed themselves. The still-burning fires scorched me. The sun set, the atmosphere grew dim, and the evening star no longer shone companionless. The glare of flames attested the progress of destruction, while well, during mingled light and obscurity, the piles around me took gigantic proportions and weird shapes. For a moment I could yield to the creative power of the imagination, and for a moment we, I was soothed by the sublime fictions presented to me. The beatings of my human heart drew me back to that blank reality, however. Where in the wilderness of death art thou, O Raymond? Ornament of England, deliverer of Greece, hero of an unwritten story, where in this burning chaos are my dear are thy dear relics strewn? I called aloud for him, through the darkness of night, over the scorching ruins of fallen Constantinople. His name was heard, no voice replied, the echo even was mute. I was overcome by weariness, the solitude depressed my spirits. The sultry air impregnated with dust, the heat and smoke of burning palaces pa palsied my limbs. Hunger came suddenly, 
acutely upon me. The excitement which had hitherto sustained me was lost, as a building whose props are loosened and whose foundations rock, totter and fall, so when enthusiasm hope deserted me, so did my strength fail. I sat on the sole remaining step of an edifice, which even in its downfall was huge and magnificent. A few broken walls, not dislodged by gunpowder, stood in fantastic groups, and a flame glittered at intervals on the summit of the pile. For a time hunger and sleep contended, till the constellations reeled before my eyes, and then they were lost. I strove to rise, but my heavy lids closed, my limbs overwearied, claimed repose. I rested my head on the stone. I yielded to the graceful sensation of utter forgetfulness, and in that scene of desolation, on that night of despair, I slept. Okay, I'm going to see how long chapter 3 is here before we... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... Okay, uh... I, admittedly, I've been saying that I want to do longer episodes, but I do not have the steam this evening to push through chapter three, and I'd, I'd rather be more awake rather than, you know, half asleep trying to read further. Um, so we're going to cut it a little short. Uh, we just now are about to hit two out two hours, so this is only an hour and a half episode, uh, and for that I apologize, you know, like I said, I've been wanting these episodes to be longer, both for the sake of the listener and for the sake of myself, uh, but it's just, you know, some nights I don't have it, uh, and that's one of these nights, uh, let's see, let me look at a calendar real quick to double check if next Friday is where I think it is. Okay, next Friday is the 17th. Uh, Friday after that is Christmas Eve, uh, and I am unlikely to be able to do an episode that week, uh, the 24th of December. Um, so this won't matter much to the podcast listeners. I will uh, pick up the slack with uh, likely more Sherlock Holmes uh, I'm not sure if we completed the Red-Headed League or not. Uh, that's really the only obvious one that springs to mind when I'm thinking of uh, tales that we need to finish. Uh, I'll double-check if we completed that particular tale of Sherlock Holmes. If we have not, I'll uh, pick up that slack uh, in a separate recording, and we'll use that as a... Uh, We'll use that as an episode to fill the blank uh, left by both this shorter episode and the lack of live episode on um, on Christmas Eve. Anyway, that's that's the programming notes. Uh, I will still endeavor to aim for uh, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, just because that gives me a few hours to eat and uh, decompress after work. Anyway, uh, programming notes noted, uh, time noted, uh, keep one eye on the Paper Cuts Pod Twitter, I believe that's Paper Cuts underscore pod, uh, oh, and I put the Discord link in the show notes, and I'm going to continue to do that going forward, uh, unless you're on iTunes. Uh, if you're on iTunes, I'm sorry. Uh, iTunes, I have a very limited volume of description space, so you're just gonna have to, uh, find the Discord, uh, linked elsewhere. There's several links all over the place. It, ideally, it is linked in most of the descriptions of my YouTube videos. Uh, anyway, I, I, I just keep digressing to try and... I just keep digressing. Uh, anyway, this has been Paper Cuts, and I hope it didn't stink.